Well, good morning and a Clovis Rodeo welcome to you today, all right? Good to have you here. Thank you for visiting with us. If you were a guest today, uh, this is a special... Oh, she's got, she's, she's got her box seat sign there. Uh, actually, let me take care of this before we get into serious stuff here at church. Most of you know I've been going to the rodeo since I was about six years old when my grandfather McLean and my dad took me for the very first time, bought my first outfit. They bought my first outfit at Sasano's. All right, downtown Pulaski, it's still there, all right? I had no idea when I got my shaps and my vest and my first pair of boots uh, that one day I would preach the uh, memorial celebrations for both Mr. and Mrs. Sassano uh, and for, their, uh, for one of their two boys. So um, it's, been, it's been quite a wonderful journey with that family over the years. Um, and, and I'm in a lurch today. I, I, I have had uh, the same box seats tickets for about the last 10 years, and I didn't get them this year. Okay, uh, not quite sure what happened, but anyway, there was a mix-up. So I, I am ticketless today. So, and they're sold out. So my last resort will be I show up and I, I play, I, well, I play the card of who I know which I really don't like to do that card, all right? That's, that's not a fun card. So if anybody has a, a, a rodeo ticket and you're not able to use it, I'll take one, two, or three of them, all right? Uh, but, but anyway, so yeah, and, I, and, and, and when I say take them, I will be happy to pay you for them, all right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so not, not take, I'll be happy to pay. Uh, so anyway, now moving right along, if you are a guest today, thank you for being at New Hope Church on Rodeo Sunday. Uh, there's a communication card in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to take it out, fill it out, write on it your information, and we make a promise. We will not sell it to Amazon or Google. We will not beat on your door. We will not pester you on the phone through the mail, and that's even snail mail. We're going to send it through the mail, uh, information that tells you about our church, what we believe, the kind of ministries we have, the services that uh, are available for you to participate in if you would like to, uh, how to get acquainted, who our staff is, hopefully answer most of the questions you would have. And uh, if you would like a personal touch, you can indicate that on there, and then we are happy uh, to make that call or make that personal touch. But otherwise, it will be through the mail. So thank you for doing that. Those cards are also for church family to get information to the staff uh, that we need to know, prayer requests, uh, surgeries, follow-ups, those kind of things. Uh, please use those cards and drop them in the offering when they come by. Uh, let me highlight several announcements and some items of praise, and then we'll talk about a couple of uh, uh, prayer requests. This is a little bit different Sunday. We've kind of had three different Sundays in a row, all right? A couple of weeks ago was Easter, all right, which is always wonderful. Uh, last week was bab turned out to be Baptism Sunday, and we baptized 14 in our our two services, uh, later services, last Sunday, and that was really, really an exciting day. And today, we're going to be uh, sharing together in communion, remembering what uh, what Christ did on crucifixion day before he rose again from the dead on Easter Sunday. And so, we'll just be celebrating that, and it's so appropriate in the context of where we are in the sermon series on the subject of forgiveness. And so uh, there's an insert in your bulletin. Don't worry about it. We'll talk about that during the sermon, all right? Now, as soon as I say that, everybody's going to pull it out and start looking at it. Really, don't worry with it. Well, it'll make sense when we get to, get to that part of the sermon. Uh, I will tell you one bit of great news. Last week, um, as you know, we took a special offering for uh, the Roots who are heading back to Uganda, all right, to, uh, to see, to visit, to share with our missionary family from New Hope, who is now working in Uganda, the Actuses. And uh, the project that we wanted to help them with is they are uh, teaching a school to women who have been engaged in slavery, in prostitution, in prostitution slavery, who have been kicked out of their villages and just abandoned, who have been abused uh, by their husbands and had nowhere to go. And they have started a school program there, and we helped fund four for this coming year, last December, and a new component that they wanted to add to that school was uh, seamstress training, because this is a career then that these women can go into and be, be independent of, of, of others, and uh, there were need of buying sewing machines, and they were hoping to have uh, enough resources to buy four sewing machines for each of the three schools that are currently going, so that was for a total of, uh, of 12 sewing machines, and uh, we received enough and sent with 
the roots so they can buy them while they are there, enough for 16 sewing machines, all right? So, great job, guys. Wonderful job last week. And I know sewing machines sounds like such a small deal to us, all right? That is a huge deal in their world, all right? And uh, uh, the price of that sewing machine is probably equivalent for some of them of two to three years' worth of wages, all right? And so just absolutely remarkable. So thank you for your generosity on very short notice. Uh, all right, let me highlight some announcements here very, very quick. And I am missing a click clipboard, so uh, this one may have to go all the way around unless there's one over there. All right, next Sunday afternoon at uh, 1230, there is going to be uh, a small group fiesta potluck. If you were part of a small group, they would like for you to come be part of this uh, lunchtime event together. Uh, they have some things to share with every one of our small groups. They would like you to share what you've been doing in your small group with the others. And then if you are not part of a, a small hope group around New Hope, but you'd like to know more about it, then uh, you come join the potluck and find out, all right? And you just might look around and say, hey, that looks like a fun group I'd like to be a part of. And if they don't let you in their small group, let me know, all right? Because um, uh, they shouldn't be that selfish, all right? Um, moving right along to hope groups, all right? Let's move on. Uh, what are we going to talk about next? I'm looking at my cheater sheet up there, all right? Ryan usually follows me. Pick, Ryan. There we go. Widow's Lunch Bunch is also meeting at the same time, uh, and uh, they're having Italian food, all right? And that's at 1230 next Sunday as well. Now I'll go back to taking charge, all right? Uh, Primetime Luncheon is May the 9th. That's our senior luncheon, not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. And uh, one of our own, Shirley Passarella, is going to be the key speaker at the luncheon that day, talk about her artwork and her painting. And uh, I think there's even going to be something special afterwards. So please read the insert in your bulletin about that very special day with our seniors. Just just to highlight, Mother's Day is coming up two weeks from today, so do not forget that, please. Uh, National Day of Prayer is this coming Thursday, all right? That is May the 4th. There are two events. They're listed in your bulletin. One of them is downtown Fresno in the evening. The easiest one for those of us in Clovis is at noontime in downtown Clovis. Uh, most of you know where the 500 Club is. Just go two blocks east, all right? It's right across from Clark Intermediate School, right there by City Hall. It's a beautiful shaded area. You can take a chair if you would like. They do have some chairs out, and there's seating uh, that is already provided. Uh, it's very shady, so no matter how warm the day will be, it's always very pleasant out there at noontime. I've been part of this for over 20 years. I'm unable to attend uh, on that day. But Mark Addis, our new full-time associate pastor, is going to be part of the leadership of that day. He will have a part presenting the National Day of Prayer to our community. I would love for great support from New Hope Church to be at that event. Uh, it's a National Day of Prayer. Ronald Reagan instituted this many, many years ago. I think it's a good thing that we have continued to do as we recognize that our nation needs prayer. And in light of the shootings in Fresno in recent weeks, in light of the fact I got an email just yesterday that we have lost nine Marines in some conflicts in Afghanistan in the last four days out of one unit. It's called the U.S. Dark Horse Battalion Number no. 9. And so I want you to remember from them. So this is a great opportunity for us to show communities, the unity of the church on this National Day of Prayer. It would be great encourage, encouragement for Mark to have him there. It starts precisely at 12 noon. You don't have to stand up in front and do anything. There'll be some worship music. There'll be some prayers. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a, a terrific time for us to display our confidence in God at a time like this. Um, uh, how many of you think you might be able to make it at 12 noon? Just give me a show of hands. All right, got some hands there. Oh, tur, tur, oh God, you guys are so good. Thank you, thank you. About 15 or 20 of you. If we get that in the next service, we'll hit. And then some of you didn't raise your hand, pray about it. <laughs> pray about going to the National Day of Prayer. Sometimes I crack me up. Um, so, so anyway, uh, it, it'll be a good day. It'll be a good time. And it's always over before 1 o'clock, so you'll have time to get back uh, to work need be. All right. Uh, let's see. Wednesday night program just kicked off again with our Jams kids, our kids from uh, kindergarten all the way through sixth grade. They're doing a science study about the Bible. And uh, man, there was a lot of activity around there this past Friday night. If they didn't make it last week, parents, it's not too late to get your kids to come. Offered that same hour from seven to eight is also an adult study called The Song. It is using the Song of Solomon. That's the uh, writings of a king as he talked about intimacy with his 
uh, with his wife, and it's a contrast to what our intimacy with God ought to look like. And so uh, it's a great study. There was about 16 in there this past week. Not too late to join that group as well. So check it out this Wednesday night, and if you're rushed for dinner uh, to come to that event, come and have dinner here. It's ready for you uh, uh, about uh, 5.45. 6.15. Yeah, tell you what I know. All right. So at 6.15, dinner is ready to go. Uh, I think that highlights the announcements that I needed to make to you. Um, let's see. I've just been informed. Can I share this one out loud? Yeah. This prayer request? All right. Uh, Patty from the 8 o'clock service is having a tumor next to her thyroid removed Tuesday at Kaiser. All right, so we want to be praying for Patty this week and that surgery. Uh, I also found out that uh, Courtney, that's Tim Sloan's daughter, who I just married a weekend ago, uh, is having some surgery that just came up in the last couple of days. She's also having that on Tuesday this week. Uh, Fred Mendren shared a prayer request on Facebook, and I got to talk to him this morning a little bit about it. Uh, in the complex where they live, uh, there was a 22-month-old boy who got a hold of his uh, father's nail gun, all right, for work, and uh, it went through his chest. And so he is in critical care at the moment, and so we want to be remembering that family. Uh, mother's name is Kayla Scott. So if you would remember, I know they would appreciate it. We have got 32 women uh, up at a women's retreat with about 350 other women throughout the valley, all right? So they are having, I am sure, a grand time. Tim, have you heard anything? Oh, they're on their way home. Oh, good. They'll be here for the 1045 service then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, out of those 32 uh, wives and women who are gone, how many of those husbands are here without their wives in this? Go look at those men. Good job. Outstanding, guys. I'm proud of you. Good thing it wasn't football season. Uh, no, just kidding, guys. You would have been here. You would have been here. I know it. Uh, okay, uh, Charlene, uh, Bernice's uh, daughter, is home from Stanford, and we are so excited about it. It's almost four months now, all right, that she's been away from us and uh, away from her home. She went through a bone marrow transplant and just now got to the level that she could come home. There'll be many more trips back and forth to Stanford, but at least she gets to be home for a while, and we're grateful for that. Uh, two families that we've uh, been engaged with memorial services in the past week, the Heskett family, and then just yesterday, the Zurigan, Zurigan family. Uh, he was a mass mutual life insurance guy for a long, long time in the area, uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's in 87 and, and had to retire from work in 1990. Uh, just a terrific family. Some of you might remember Java Jeff uh, used to have the coffee shop in downtown Clovis. This was Java Jeff's brother. All right. And so uh, Java, Java Jeff is back in town. I always thought Jeff was his last name because Java was his first name. Um, uh, he, he, he ran a coffee house. So just be remembering them, please. Uh, those are all the updates that we wanted to share with you. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward if they would, please. And wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Gentlemen, would you come? Join with me in prayer. Father, thank you for the life that you share with us. Thank you for the privilege we've had these last few weeks and some pretty exciting celebrations around here. Uh, first and foremost, the joy of celebrating the resurrection of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If it was not for resurrection morning, there wouldn't be hundreds of thousands of churches gathering all around the world today assembled for one reason, and that is to give thanks and worship and honor and glory to the one who died and rose again from the dead. Without the resurrection, his death would have been meaningless. So, Father, we're grateful for both. The death he died to forgive us of our sins and the life that he raised from the dead to give us life every single day. The presence of God in us is what the New Testament says is the mystery of godliness. And that was accomplished in the finished work of Christ at the cross and the tomb. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have today to join together with family, friends, friends we've never met before this morning to lift our hearts in both prayer and song to you, acknowledging that you are who you are. You love us right where we are. But you love us so much you're not willing to leave us where we are. You have a desire for us to grow, to mature, to be nurtured in our faith in you so that we walk as sons and daughters on the face of the earth of God Almighty. Thank you for that privilege. And thank you for providing the resources 
for that privilege to be real. Father, thank you for some really, really powerful things that were accomplished in our 8 o'clock service. And Father, thank you for what I trust we will give you the privilege to do in our lives in this service. As we honor and we celebrate you in communion, may we remember not to forget the incredible price you paid for us. We trust you with all the requests that we've already expressed here today and for so much more. And we do so in the awesome name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. In just a moment, uh, some gentlemen are going to come and they're going to be distributing the elements of the bread and the cup for our morning communion today. I always like to preface uh, with just a few remarks. If you are a guest today, um, it's a joy for, for us to have you as a guest at New Hope Church, but you do not have to be a, feel like that you were a guest at the Lord's table, which is what we call the communion table when we use it for communion. Um, this is a picture of what Jesus Christ did with his disciples uh, the night of his betrayal that preceded his crucifixion. He joined them around a, a table that was known as the Passover feast. And he took the elements of something that had one meaning for hundreds of years. And he gave it a new meaning for the next several hundred years. He took a piece of unleavened bread, which had significance for the Passover. It's what they had done the night before they were set free from physical captivity of the Egyptians. And so what, what symbolized physical captivity, Jesus was going to change the meaning to represent eternal freedom. Not from a place or a location, but from sin. And so the picture of the bread is a picture of the body of Christ that was beaten, bruised, and bloodied for us. And Jesus took that piece of bread into his disciples who it had meant one thing for hundreds of years. He says, every time you eat this bread, remember what I'm about to do for you. And then he picked the cup, and it wasn't a cute little plastic cup like we now have. It was probably a big goblet, possibly silver or bronze. And it was filled, grape juice or wine, and he said, this beverage is a representation of my blood, which I will pour out for you. And I do this for the forgiveness of all sin. And every time that you eat this bread, every time you drink this cup, I want you to remember what I have done for you. Don't forget what Christ has done. Don't ever live with Christ so long that we become nonchalant about the price that he paid for us. And then Jesus gave a little extra. Jesus then said, every time you eat this and every time you drink this, don't only remember the past, but anticipate the future. Remember this until I come again. And folks, if he was still stuck, trapped in a buried tomb, he couldn't come again. But because he lives we know he comes again. So, if you are a guest today, I don't want you to feel like a guest around the table, the elements. As they're delivered to your pew, uh, please feel free to take a piece of the bread. Please feel free to take one of the cups. The only requirement the Scripture gives is not that you have to be a member of the church. It's that you have to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. You are the only one in this room who answers that question. You can't answer it for me. I can't answer it for you. We answer it for ourselves in the presence of God. And if you and God are right, then we welcome you to share in communion with us today. To where we're going to do this, I'm going to ask the eight gentlemen who we previously have prepared for this, if you will come forward. Um, there are going to be some gentlemen starting uh, at the back, coming to the front, delivering the bread. There are going to be four other gentlemen beginning at the front and going to the back, delivering the cup. Uh, hopefully they don't crash at one row. Um, but as it comes down your row and you want to participate, please take a piece of the bread, take a cup, hold it. Once everyone is served, then we will share together in a brief time um, uh, eating and drinking this wonderful, memorable meal. I, I don't think... We'll probably ever be able to capture the intimacy that took place the very first time this was done. 
13 men in a room. The scripture says it was upstairs. Preparations had been made for um, this annual celebration that these men had participated in their entire life. As infants, their parents took them to the celebration. As children, they attended. And then as grown-ups, it was something that was just in great. Just as you and I celebrate Christmas, they celebrated Passover. And in the intimacy of that moment, Jesus said, I'm going to take something that has had great meaning out of your past, and I'm going to give it more meaning for the rest of your future. To do something as foolish as eating a cracker and drinking Welch's grapefruit juice. Grapefruit, Welch's grape juice. Um, it seems rather silly until we understand what it means. And just as we are going to wrap up in the message, the cycle of forgiveness, until we appreciate our own forgiveness, we'll be a little stingy about giving forgiveness. Until we've understood what the crucifixion of Christ meant for us personally, this will be a dry cracker and not near enough juice. But when we understand what it means, then this becomes a precious, intimate moment between us and God. And I hope it will be for you today. The scripture says Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, just as my body will be broken, I break this bread. And I do it willfully. I do it with a decision. Remember, in just a, a, a couple of hours, Jesus is going to go to a garden and he's not going to feel like being broken. He prayed, God, if there's some, some way we can get by without doing all this. But he made the choice to be broken. And the scripture says after he broke the bread, he then prayed and gave thanks. So would you join with me as we give thanks? Father, that first prayer, that first prayer of thanks was prayed by your son before he experienced the brokenness of body. He said thanks in advance. Today, in the comfort of padded pews in a heated or air-conditioned building, whatever the need may be, we take a small piece of bread, thank for what was done 2,000 years ago. Because what was done 2,000 years ago makes a difference for my eternal future. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's eat the bread. And then he took the cup, and he did the same thing. He said, this, is, this has got a new meaning. It's got an expanded meaning. And he said, I'm going to shed my blood for you. It was a voluntary, willful choice, not a good feeling. And as we head into the sermon today, that's important for us to understand. The idea of, of extending forgiveness to others is not a choice we need to make on how we feel. It's a choice we should make based on truth. Jesus did it for us, and he asked us to let him do it again in us. And the scripture says he took the cup, he gave thanks for it. And they drank together. Let's give thanks. Father, for this cup, it's so small in comparison to what it means. And yet you tell us we need to do these little things so we don't forget the big thing, what your son Jesus did for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together. And just as there are things like cholesterol and high blood pressure and a variety of other things that want to attack this human heart, 
There are certain enemies that try to attract this invisible heart of our personality that, uh, that loves and hates, uh, that gets, uh, that's the seat of so many of the decisions that we make. We can't find it somewhere inside of us, but we know there's this thing called our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this heart inside of us is desperately wicked and it is sick and there is no cure for it apart from the fact that God said in the book of Ezekiel that I want to come and take out that heart of stone that is wicked and I want to replace it with a heart of flesh that is supple and tender and moves according to my leadership in your lives. We've discovered there are four primary enemies to this heart of ours and it's called guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. Guilt says, I owe you. Anger says, you owe me. Greed says, what? I owe, no. Greed says, yeah. And jealousy says, God owes me. And for the last few weeks, we've been looking at anger, that one where you owe me. And out of all of the four, Anger is probably the most obvious, and perhaps out of the four, it is also the most dangerous. Our anger, when it is unleashed with unbridled intensity, it leaves a trail of destruction in its wake, often emotionally and on occasions physically. But behind all the ranting and the raving of the most basic of the human experiences, we can define anger like this. I'm not getting what I want. When you boil down almost any source or cause of anger at all, you can ultimately come back to that final answer, I didn't get my way. As we look at the enemies of our heart, we're also looking at, uh, we, 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 we have guilt. Guilt is a habit that gets developed. We have this unforgiving spirit that creates anger in us, and anger becomes a habit. And so we have to replace old habits with new habits. And we looked at guilt, and we discovered that the best habit to develop to eliminate guilt in our life is the habit of confession. And the last few weeks, as we've looked at the subject of anger, we have discovered that the habit we need to develop in our lives to get rid of anger is the habit of forgiveness. And we introduced that last week, and we want to wrap that up this week, and we want to finish this understanding of what the cycle of forgiveness is all about. We looked at two primary scriptures last week, and one of them was what I've referred to now as the short power buster scripture. It's the one that Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, where Paul wrote these words, get rid. What do you do when you clean out your garage? Hopefully you get rid of stuff. I know people who just move it out, shift it around, and move it back in, all right? They don't get rid of it. They just reorganize it. And I'm afraid that's what a lot of us do with our anger. We get it out. We unpack it. We look at it. We realize I didn't get what I wanted, and we shuffle it in another file box, and yet we put it back in the file box, and we hold on to it. And Paul says, get rid of how much of it? All. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all rage. Get rid of all anger. Get rid of all brawling. Get rid of all slander. And just in case I missed anything, every form of malice. Get rid of it all. And then he says, that's what your habits have been. You've had the habit of bitterness and rage and anger and brawling. Now, get rid of it. Replace that habit with something else. Be kind, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another. I don't think I made this observation last week. To those that you were bitter against, to those who you were angry at, to those who you have been brawling and slanderous about, to those you've had any form of malice towards, be kind and consider. See, I think we've divided this verse. Okay, I'm going to get rid of all those things, but I can just ignore those people now. No, no. This context tells us to those that you have felt that way about, now 
Be kind and compassionate to one. How on this side of Hades am I going to do that? The next line tells us, forgiving each other, two key words. What are they? That's it, yeah, say it louder. Just as. Not similar to, not kind of like, not a kissing cousin of, but just as in Christ God forgave us, we are to do that to everybody else. Now, that's the short power buster verse that we talked about last week. The longer, complicated, and challenging passage is the one found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 23 to verse 35. If you'd like to turn there, I'm just going just gonna to review it so that we can move on from there. Th- this is a passage, this is what I call an impromptu message of Jesus. In other words, and, and I find this hard to try to say impromptu when I'm talking about an omniscient Jesus, <laughs> a Jesus who knew everything, who was ready for everything, and yet this was not a sermon he prepared. This was an answer that he gave to a question. Have you ever tried to impress somebody by what you thought was some good change in your life and, and you were concerned that maybe they weren't noticing. And so you sort of f- float a question that takes them in the direction that you hope they will notice there's something different about you now than there used to be. This, this is what Peter did with Jesus in this passage. Jesus has been hanging out, or Peter's been hanging out with Jesus for a little while now. And Peter thinks he's made some big changes in his life because of what Jesus has done. And I think he kind of wants Jesus to notice. And so he throws out this question to Jesus. Peter came to Jesus. This was intentional. This was thought out. Peter came to Jesus and asked, uh, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me, and then he doesn't wait for the answer. He floats an answer out that he thinks makes him look pretty good. Jesus, should should I do that seven times? I mean, here's a guy who before Jesus was hanging with him probably wouldn't forgive you once. You were once and done in his book. But he's grown up. He's matured. He said, Jesus, I, Jesus, I'm in a place in my life I can forgive others seven times. What do you think about that, Jesus? <laughs> he, he nor I think did any of the rest of us expect the answer that he got. Jesus then tells a story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000, I'm, I'm, I'm changing versions here. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Uh, in a newer version, it says 10,000 bags of gold. Now, I don't care what the price of gold is at the moment. If you've got 10,000 bags of it, that's a whole lot of money. And this is what he owed. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, all they had, be sold to repay the debt. Now, do you think he's going to get enough for that family to pay the debt? No way. It's going to fall way, way short. Couldn't, couldn't do that in a lifetime. Then the servant fell on his knees before him. He said, be patient with me. And he should have stopped right there. Instead, he said, I'll pay everything back. What this man owed was impossible for him to pay back in multiple lifetimes. The servant's master took pity on him. He had mercy. And notice the next line. He canceled the debt and he let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. We go from 10,000 bags of gold to 100 small pieces of silver. Uh, My arms aren't big enough, okay? That's how much gap there was in these two debts. And he said, the servant said to him, be patient with me, I will pay back everything. And the servant's master, no, I skipped a verse, I'm sorry, verse 28. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. 
His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. You thought that would have reminded him of what he had just done. It's one of the reasons we do communion is so we don't forget to remember. And the servant said, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused and instead he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And are you ever going to pay the debt from prison? Never. Never. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went out and their master told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in and he said, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers until he could pay back all he owed. And in verse 35, this is the zinger statement. This is the part that I struggle with. This is the part that nobody expected. If Peter was still wondering what any of this story had to do with his original question, how many times do I forgive my brother? It's about to become really clear. Jesus said, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Let me summarize. If we hold out waiting to be paid back for the wrongs that have been done to us, we are the ones who will end up paying. If on the other hand, we cancel the debts owed to us, and that's what it means to be set free, cancel the debts. That's what forgiveness means, cancel the debt. It's what Jesus said on the cross, paid in full. The debt is done. It's gone. It's wiped out. The thing that makes this complicated parable so helpful is that Jesus talks about an emotionally charged topic of forgiveness in terms that everybody can understand. He takes the mystery out of it. Simply put, forgiveness is the decision to cancel a debt. This is so simple, this is so practical, but it is so easily missed. The deeper meaning of the parable of the ungrateful servant probably didn't hit Peter until months later. This story probably did not have as big an impact at the moment that Jesus told it as it did months later when Jesus was on the seashore and a res- uh, when, when Peter was on the seashore and Jesus, the resurrected Savior, was frying fish for Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times because Peter had denied Jesus three times. Now Peter's beginning to understand something in the shadow of the cross about the deep forgiveness of God and the canceling of debt. The story began to make sense. You see, the deeper meaning of the parable is when Peter could see Jesus hanging from a Roman cross. Peter now understood the price of forgiveness. If Jesus paid that price to forgive me, then who am I to withhold forgiveness from anybody in my world? You see, God's decision to forgive Peter and us required the death of his son. Peter's decision, our decision to forgive those who have offended him and us Quite frankly, folk, it's only going to cost us our pride. Which price was bigger? But until we understand the cup and the bread and what that really means for ourselves, we're going to be cheap with our forgiveness, and we're going to cling to it. You see, in the shadow of my hurt, forgiveness feels like a decision of rewarding my enemy. But in the shadow of the cross, forgiveness is merely a gift from one undeserving soul to another. Forgiveness is the gift that ensures my freedom from the prison of bitterness and resentment. When I accept the forgiveness from God, I'm set free from the penalty of my sin. And when I extend forgiveness to my adversary, there's a sense in which I'm set free from his sin against me as well. 
This is the force behind Paul's exhortation. Be kind and compassionate, forgiving, just as in Christ God forgave you. The kind of forgiveness Paul is talking about does not make any sense unless we're a forgiven person. Just as the cup and the bread doesn't make any sense unless we have appropriated what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago on that cross until we understand the cross, the cup and the bread is a goofy thing to do. And until we understand the forgiveness of God for ourselves, to forgive somebody else is a goofy thing for us to do. I want my pound of flesh. That what seems to be right. But Paul wrote this to the church at Ephesus. Paul was writing on this subject of forgiveness to other believers who should have understood the unconditional love of God for them so that now that unconditional love of God could work through them. Whenever I talk to somebody who's hesitant to forgive, and and let me pause just briefly. Hopefully he'll never see the tape on this. There's a friend of mine. He floats in and out of New Hope. He showed up at 8 o'clock service today. 8 o'clock service is set up different than this. As you know, we're over in the other building. He sat right there. Right there. Right down the center. The whole sermon, I'm pretty much... I've dealt with this friend... For almost 18 years on this subject. I didn't know this would be the Sunday he would float in. I got to tell you, it doesn't happen often. 80% through the sermon, he raised his hand. I wasn't quite sure what he might say. I called on him and he said, I just want this room to know you preach that just for me. And he briefly shared a story, and this is a gentleman who never could say anything briefly. And he briefly shared his story of anger for years at his own son who last year committed suicide. And he told that story with tears in his eyes. And he said, I'm telling you, I I think I must have preached a lot of crappy sermons before because he says, this is the best one for me I've ever heard. But the point is, it wasn't until he connected the unconditional love of God that put the Son of God on a cross to pay for our sin that he understood how he and his situation could forgive. And I think he let it go. It was so good. And this, oh, it was so good. You see, whenever I talk to someone who's hesitant to forgive, It's because this person is evaluating their decision in light of what was done to them rather than in the light of what was done for them. And that's a big difference. Perspective is everything. As a believer, I'm called and liberated to view forgiveness from the perspective of the cross. Like the servant in Jesus' parable, I've been forgiven a debt that I never could repay. The least I can do is cancel the debts owed to me by others. That's what it means just as. If we're a Christian, we aren't expected to treat others the way we've been treated by others. We've been called to treat people the way that we have been treated by our Heavenly Father. We don't forgive because the other person deserves it. We don't forgive because we feel like it. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And the one who forgave us now lives in us to do through us what we could never do ourselves. Paul wasn't talking about a one-time transaction either. This is a present tense use of the term forgiving. It's a mindset. It's an attitude. It's a habit that must be developed. It's a way of life for a man and a woman committed to keeping their hearts free of worldly entanglements like anger and bitterness. It's the first line of defense in the face of disappointment and hurt. The word Paul chose for this admonition of forgiveness conveys the idea that forgiveness is a gift, a gift we're constantly giving, like a grandfather who's always doling out quarters to the grandkids at the arcade. So we are to be prepared to forgive on a moment's notice. Specifically, we are called to cancel debts as fast as they occur. 
This doesn't mean that forgiveness will be something that we immediately feel or feel like doing. I got to be honest. I don't know that initially I've ever felt like forgiving somebody. It runs contrary to our sense of justice and fairness. It's unlikely we'll ever feel like forgiving. But in the scriptures, forgiveness is never presented as a feeling. It's always described as a decision. Think about the night of communion. Jesus said in advance, this will be my body broken. This will be my blood shed. And a few hours later, he went to a garden. Did he feel like being crucified? He said, Lord, if there's any way this whole thing can move out of my life, if we can accomplish your purpose some other way, I don't feel like doing this. Did he make his decision on how he felt? And aren't we glad today? Forgiveness is a gift we decide to give in spite of how we feel. So how do we slay our anger? There's four phases or steps or processes to complete this cycle of forgiveness. And I'm going to do this very quickly. This is where I want you to pull out that little piece of paper in your, in your, in your bulletin, all right? And turn it over to the back side. Don't worry about the, the front side, all right? I know there's three, three repetitious things there. Uh, for some of you, that'll be too many. For some of you know, us, it's probably not near enough. Um, but for the moment, just, just, just turn to the blank side, okay? Uh, because uh, as I say something that you think of that you need to write down, just write it on the blank side, all right? There should be pencils if you don't have one. Um, uh, here, here's the deal. This is not a test. You're not going to be scored. So do, do not peek over the shoulder of the person sitting next to you. First of all, it's none of your business. <laughs> Second of all, I'll have to practice the art of forgiveness if I catch you doing that, okay? First step, we must identify who we're angry at. This might seem kind of silly, but it's not, and here's why. Forgiveness is more than a decision to move on and forget. Trying to forget a debt is not the same thing as canceling a debt. I recommend that you make a list of the people who you believe have mistreated or taken advantage of you. Go back as far as you like, but don't assume you've forgiven somebody just because you've put it behind you. Who do you hope to never see again? Write their name down. Who do you find yourself having imaginary conversations with where you're the one doing all the talking? Who would you like to pay back if you thought you could get away with it? Who do you secretly desire to see fail? Go ahead and poke around in every area of your life, your family, your friends, your ex-boyfriend or girlfriends, your ex-husbands or wives, your deceased parent, folks you've worked with, coaches, bosses. I understand I'm poking the lion and this is not fun. But I promise you it is important. This is an opportunity for us to purge our hearts of the junk that's been hindering our relationships that value most. It's worth the effort. Write the list. The second step in slaying our anger is determine what these people owe us. This is the step that I've kind of thought through that I think most, most people skip. As a result, we forgive generally, but not specifically. You see, when Christ died for the sins of the world on the cross, he died generally for all the sin of the world. But until I appropriate it personally, it does me no good. Till we identify personally what the problem is, what is owed, we really can't forgive it correctly. The king forgave a specific amount owed him by the servant. We must determine what we feel like we are owed, what hurt us. You know what the person who hurt you did, but what exactly did they take? Until you know the answer to that question, you've not really forgiven. Until you know the answer to that question, you will go through the motions of forgiveness, but you will have no freedom. I've heard this a thousand times, but I've already forgiven him. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah, that's working good for you, isn't it? Usually, this is spoken with intensity that is obvious forgiveness has not really taken place. General forgiveness does not heal specific hurts. It's important we pinpoint what was taken. And what do the people on our list owe us? 
What did they take from us? What would they need to return in order to put things back the way they were? Would it be an apology? Would it be money? Would it be time? Would it be marriage? Would it be a family? Would it be a job, a reputation, an opportunity, a promotion, a chapter of your life? Be specific. You can't cancel the debt until you've identified it. Step three. Once you've identified the people and you've identified the debt, now cancel the debt. After identifying what was taken, cancel it. That means deciding that the offending party doesn't owe you anything anymore. Just as Christ canceled our sin debt at Calvary, so you and I, just as, must cancel the debts that others have incurred against us. This may be as simple as a decision that we make quietly in our heart, or we may want to mark the decision with something more tangible. In Charles Stanley's book, Charles Stanley is the father of Andy Stanley, in a book that he wrote called The Gift of Forgiveness, he tells the story of how he marked the day that he forgave his stepfather, John. He actually sat across an empty chair and spoke as if his stepfather were present. He recounted all the offenses he had held against John through the years, and then he said to that empty chair as if John were sitting there, I forgive you, you don't owe me anything anymore. And he got up and he walked away, and he left his anger and resentment behind Charles said in his book, whenever those old feelings begin to stir, I keep them at bay by reminding myself that those are issues that are settled. John doesn't owe me anymore. I've heard of people who have listed what was owed, put the list in an envelope, and then they burned it. And they declared the debts canceled. I heard of one woman who buried her list in the backyard. The problem was her husband dug it up. I, I, heard, about another, I heard about another fellow who actually nailed his list to a cross as a reminder that Christ had suffered for their sins as well. There are advantages of physicalizing our decision to forgive. This can be especially helpful for those who hurt us, and this happened in the past, and maybe we can't see them again. They're gone. But for the daily offenses we incur, here's a quick, simple, but specific declaration this is what I think it takes. Turn the page over to the written prayer. It's the same prayer, just three times. Heavenly Father, blank has taken blank from me. I've held on to this debt long enough. I choose to cancel this debt. What is it? This person doesn't owe me anymore. Just as you forgave me, I forgive. Write their name again. Okay, you did some work on the backside. Transfer it to the front side. You didn't do the work on the back side, but you know you should have? Write their name on the front side. For some of you, you'll just use the top one. For some of you, you might just use two. For some, three is a perfect number. For some, I got more pages up here. Or you can just leave it one back. In just a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to physically do something with what you filled out to get rid of it. Pastors are often asked if it's necessary to tell the person you've forgiven that you have, in fact, forgiven them. I'm going to tell you my opinion. My opinion is no. In fact, often it could do more harm than good. In many cases, the offending party doesn't feel or know that there was ever anything wrong between you. And sharing your decision to forgive them will come across as an accusation against them. The one time that I believe it's always appropriate is when somebody asks you for forgiveness or they return to apologize for an incident from the past. Otherwise, this transaction is between you and God. Last of all, dismiss the case. This is the fourth step. Dismiss the case. The final process centers on a daily decision not to reopen this. What makes this so difficult is that our feelings don't automatically follow our decision. Besides forgiving somebody doesn't besides forgiving somebody that does not erase our memories and occasionally those memories come flooding back. One of two things usually happens at that juncture. We either one take hold of the offense all over again and crank up our imagination or we try not to think about it and just leave it behind. When memories of past hurts flood into us again, face them. Allow ourselves to remember the incident. Take the opportunity to restate the decision you've already made. He doesn't owe me anything anymore. She doesn't owe me anything anymore. It's the same thing we do with, with the book of Romans. There is therefore now 
no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When Satan makes us feel guilty because of our past sin, we take him back to that decision. I'm not condemned anymore. Then we thank our Heavenly Father for giving us the grace and the strength to forgive. Don't accept the lie that we haven't forgiven. The question that begs to be asked in all this, is it wrong to want to be paid back for what was taken? The answer is quite simple to that question. No. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be repaid. The problem is that in most cases, it's impossible to be reimbursed for what was taken. Once again, Jesus' parable speaks to this dilemma. The king who forgave the servant's debt was going to be out a lot of money. The servant owed him far more than he could ever pay. Restitution was out of the question. Selling the fellow's wife and possessions and children wouldn't begin. And so it is with us. Whenever people are pressed to tell exactly what was taken from you by those who hurt you the most and what would it take to make things right, they often look bewildered. Suddenly they're faced with a realization they are owed a debt they can never get back. I mean, can a man who abandoned his kids ever really replace what was taken from them? Can a son who's made a parent's life hell for years give back what was taken? How do you restore time and affection? How does a mother repay a grown daughter back for not being there to tuck her in at night as a child? You can't pay back a missing relationship. You can't pay back a reputation. There's no way to make up for years of criticism, neglect, and abuse. How does someone give you back your innocence and your purity? These debts cannot be repaid. The best thing to do, just as, cancel them. Nothing makes up for the past. There's an emotional element involved in our hurt that cannot be compensated for, even with apologies or promises or finances. Apology does not erase experience. And to cling to our hurt while waiting to be repaid is to allow the seeds of bitterness to take root and grow. When that happens, we allow the person who hurt us once to hurt us over and over and over again. Randy? Would you mind coming to the piano? Um, pick one. Just as I am, amazing grace. Pick, pick, pick something appropriate. It's, it's been my experience that when a person discovers they have heart disease, our overriding concern isn't how did we get it or where did it come from or whose fault is it? The number one question is how do I fix it? We should be driven by a similar concern when it comes to anger that pollutes our heart. Blaming won't make us better. Holding out for apology won't satisfy us. The cure is forgiveness. We may need to spend some time dealing with unfinished business from our past. Hopefully, the four processes outlined in this message will help us do that. But in a world where neglect and insensitivity and injustice are the norm rather than the exception, forgiveness must be a habit in our lives. Of the four monstrous forces we'll discuss, I believed unresolved anger from intentional and unintentional hurt is the most devastating Yet in some ways, it's the easiest to overcome. We choose to cancel the debt. We decide and declare, you don't owe me any more. You don't owe me any more. From one forgiven soul to another, you don't owe me. I'm going to ask you to do something kind of significant. Hopefully you've been filling it in. Finish filling it in. I, I, you probably had names before I even start asking you to think about names. I'm going to ask you while Randy plays, maybe if he chooses to sing along whatever he's playing, he can do that too. But I'm going to ask you to get up from where you are. I'm going to ask you to do what I'm doing right now with this piece. This is the 21st century technology coming to a sermon. I'm going to ask you to get rid of them. 
shred them. You're getting these out of your, you are doing what Paul said, you are getting rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and malice. You're saying, Tim, no, you're not. You're saying, God, it's time I forgave just as you forgave. Our Father, just what you shared with the disciples 2,000 years ago was a symbol of what your work was going to be for all of us. What we've done today is a symbol that we're going to allow you to do once again your work in us. Father, thank you for your generosity to forgive us of every sin, every failure, of every ungodly purpose we've attempted to perpetuate throughout our life. And thank you that you are prepared to give us the strength and the fortitude. You've given us the direction of how we can take your forgiveness and use it in our relationships with each other. Thank you. I pray that there'll be a real process of healing and restoration and recovery that will begin to take place in all of our lives as a result of what we've done today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.